The chair now recognizes Mr. Schneider. Uh, thank you, and I want to thank the witnesses for uh, your patience with us here today. Uh, a couple of real quick questions. When did Israel pull out of Gaza? In 2005, Five. yes. And who was in control after Israel left? Well, initially the PA, and then there was a coup, so it was Hamas after that. And when did the coup happen? 2007. Right. And since 2007, when Gaza violently uh, threw out Fatah and, and took over Gaza, how many escalatory conflicts have there been between Israel and Hamas that have resulted in a negotiated ceasefire? At least six. At, at least six. And, and they have been very tenuous ceasefires. They have been, they've been good for a couple of days, good for a couple of months, and then they've collapsed. Yeah. Um, when was the last ceasefire negotiated before this conflict? 2021. Uh, I think it was May 19, 2021, 870 days before October 7th. Uh, what was the status of the ceasefire on October 6th? Was Israel observing it? Well, you know, uh, yes, of course. Um, I, I would say that it was um, it was a sort of on and off again affair because you occasionally had rockets and so forth uh, pop off. So, yeah. But Israel was observing it. And so I'm going to ask obvious questions. We've touched on these over the course of the day. And again, thank you for your time. But who violated the ceasefire on October 7th? Uh, very clearly, Hamas. Who slaughtered 260 young people at a music festival on that October 7th? That would be Hamas. Who murdered more than 130 people at Kibbutz Beiri on October 7th? Hamas. Who butchered children at a nursery in Kibbutz Kfar Aza on October yeah. 7th? Hamas. Right. Um, is it a war crime to intentionally target civilians? Absolutely. War crime to use rape and torture as a tactic? Absolutely. To burn people alive in their homes? Absolutely. To take more than 240 people hostage? Absolutely. To deny those people who they took hostage visits from the International Committee of the Red Cross or the necessary health care? Absolutely. Is it a war crime to use an ambulance to transport fighters and weapons? Yes, it is. How about to launch rockets from civilian neighborhoods, from hospitals, mosques, and schools? Yes, it is. Using human shields, is that a war crime? It is. So let me ask a broader question, because we have talked about this war, and we went through a, a rapid-fire list of questions. But let me be very clear. I see the suffering of the civilians in this war. It's the civilians who always get caught in the middle of the war. I've said that many times. And we need to bring this war to as rapid conclusion as is humanly possible, because the civilians in Gaza and in Israel are suffering. Almost a million people have been displaced in Gaza. Almost a quarter of a million people have been displaced in Israel. But what would happen if Israel were to agree to a ceasefire before dismantling Hamas's ability to fight or to rule over Gaza? Congressman, you put your finger on the, on the issue right here, uh, and I would agree complete with you. The, 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 the suffering in Gaza among civilians is wrenching. It's emotionally wrenching for all of us who are working on this, this issue. It is wrenching for the governments and the publics in the, in the Middle East who are watching this. And on the other hand, to, um, to call a ceasefire right now, which might or might not be uh, honored uh, by Hamas, would be to leave Hamas uh, in control of 240-some uh, hostages, including babies and children, and would also leave uh, fairly well intact or much of the military infrastructure and war fighting capacity and terrorism uh, capacity of Hamas intact. Yeah. Let me take, build on that for one second, because you use two terms I think are important to distinguish, war fighting and terrorism. What is war fighting? And maybe, Ms. Stroll, that's the question uh, for the Department of Defense. What does it mean to say war fighting? It means to use military force to achieve an objective. Okay. Distinct from terrorism, though. Terrorism is crossing a border, beheading babies, raping women, killing concert goers. Its intention is to cause trauma and terror, terror to an entire society. Isn't that correct? The point is terror. The war fighting is soldier on soldier. But as we saw on October 7th, uh, what Hamas did was in no way a war. It was pure terrorism. And has it been United States message, President Biden, and let me say this, Thank goodness for President Biden. His moral clarity and political courage in this uh, conflict has been just extraordinary. And I know it is appreciated by the people in Israel, and it should be equally appreciated by the people in the United States and ar around the world. But has he made it clear that Israel has a right to defend itself? But when we talk about that, is in the context of war fighting. Absolutely, and it has a it has an obligation to defend its people from terrorism okay. and from the kind of attacks that we saw on October 7th. Right. I, I'm I'm out of time. Let me 
comment on two last things. Uh, one is a quote that you said at the very beginning in your opening remarks. The U.S. commitment to Israel is ironclad. Um, we've said that. The President has said that. Is it fair to also say that the U.S. commitment, as it has been in Camp David, in bringing peace to Egypt and Israel, in the Oslo Accords, in the negotiations between Jordan and Israel for peace, in the leadership it has showed in the Abraham Accords. It's also fair that the United States is also committed to bringing peace to both Israel and the Palestinians once Hamas is defeated. Absolutely, and it's the only way that we will not see a terrible repeti repetition of these events. Thank you. I yield back. So when yields, uh, Chair recognizes Mr. James. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ambassador Lee, thank you for your time and uh, for your stamina. I have a quick question for you, uh, followed by a couple others. Um, how do we address the anti-Semitism at the UN? Uh, that's an excellent. Uh, that's an excellent question. I'm not sure I could give you a, a, a five-minute or a four-minute, 36-second uh, uh, answer to that. Um, it is. It is really something that we've seen for years. Um, and it is a very casual kind of anti-Semitism um, that we see among uh, some member states. Um, and Madam, I, I would uh, respectfully correct you. There's no such thing as casual anti-Semitism. But uh, let, me, let me try. Uh, earlier this year, I led uh, 30 of my colleagues in sending a letter to the State Department promoting the Abraham Accords in Africa. I share this with you because I believe that the Trump administration's vision of peace in the Middle East and abroad is in jeopardy following the horrendous attack on October 7th. Uh, this was an attack against not just innocent Israelis, but uh, on, on humanity broadly. Um, there's a sense that advancements uh, in Israeli normalization uh, might be on long pause, that this bloodshed on October 7th of innocent civilians on all sides might yield yet another generation of dispute, terror, and meaningless death. Is that also your assessment? Oh, there's a great risk of that, yes. Okay. Uh, so, Ms. Stroll, um, the Abraham Accords, I believe, was our, our best diplomatic strategy to box out Iran and to show the world that American leadership can truly lead to peace, which we've done so many times in our great nation's history. Uh, part of what we're seeing with the United Nations uh, in the destabilization that is being fomented by Russia and China is that they are trying to break the global south away from alignment with the United States that impedes our interests abroad and threatens America and our allies. The progress that was meant to be made instead of launching bombs and firing bullets through extending the Abraham Accords to Africa, we could exchange culture and forge partnerships. Since the future is unknown on how the gaps will be bridged between Israel and the Arab world, how best can we avoid further entanglements with Iran and its proxies if we don't take steps like the Abraham Accords that have already worked to curb the growing spheres of communist influence emanating from Beijing and Moscow through Tehran right now? Thank you for that question. What is clear is that Iran, Russia, and China all view themselves as benefiting from challenging the rules-based international order. And the United States and our coalition of allies and partners benefits from enforcing and standing up for the rules-based international order. That includes standing up for Israel's ability to defend itself from terrorism, given what it just experienced from Hamas on October 7. And it also includes standing up and supporting Ukraine and in its war to defend itself from Russian aggression. Uh, the Department of Defense was building on the progress of the Abraham Accords through advancing regional security constructs, such as integrated air and missile defense, uh, multilateral cooperation at sea in the maritime domain. And what we're actually seeing now is that partners, even today, view that as beneficial to be cooperating, sharing intelligence, sharing information, and seeing the threats coming from Iran. Totally agree. Uh, forgive me for cutting you off. Um, but uh, one of the big things I'm very concerned with is exactly supporting that mission um, and, and boosting our capacity uh, to satisfy our obligations under FMS uh, and getting our defense industrial base in a position where it can not only support our allies, but most especially help America to defend itself. And so I'm working on, on that uh, as well. 
But uh, in the limited time that we do have, I would like to turn back to Ambassador Leaf. Uh, have you vocalized to President Biden or to Secretary Blinken any concerns for the lack of sanctions enforcement on Iran and the consequences that would manifest itself through that, like we saw on October 7th? Uh, uh, before you answer, in the last couple seconds, uh, it was widely reported this past August that there was a relaxing of sanctions on Iran to increase the supply of oil into the world so that we could have cheaper uh, uh, oil here in America. Uh, are you getting any indication that there are any relaxation of sanctions on Iran um, due, to, due to this no. issue? No, absolutely not, Congressman. Mr. Chairman, I yield. Gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes Ms. Kamlager Dove. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for uh, being here today, witnesses. Um, so I'll just say many of my Jewish constituents have loved ones in Israel who were impacted by the Hamas terrorist attacks on October 7th. And the trauma lives on with the missing hostages held in Gaza, including my constituent's grandniece, three-year-old Abigail, whose parents were killed by Hamas before she was kidnapped. Jewish and Israeli Americans have come together with Muslim and Palestinian Americans to deplore the terror and violence that innocent Palestinians are enduring in Gaza. And we are seeing an appalling rise in anti-Semitism and Islamophobia in my district and beyond, no one feels safe. I want peace, I think we all want peace. I hope we all believe that all people have the right to live with dignity, self-determination, without fear of extinction. What is abundantly clear to me is that after decades of negligence, now is the time for the United States and the international community to put our diplomatic might behind a sustainable long-term political solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Israel's security depends on it, Palestinians' humanity depends on it, and the liberal international order may suffer a fatal blow without it. I think one way to decapitate Hamas is to give the Palestinians another option. So, Secretary Leaf, how is the administration signaling that a two-state solution is the only kind of end um, that the United States will accept to this conflict. So, Congresswoman, you have, have really nicely summed up exactly where uh, the administration is, that there is urgency to, to doing exactly that, pointing the way, but more than pointing the way, building the pathway to a negotiated um, uh, Palestinian state. Um, and Secretary Link, uh, Blinken um, has been signaling that privately and publicly um, over these last over this last period, he was uh, quite to the point on this with both the Palestin Palestinian uh, Authority, uh, President Mahmoud Abbas, and with all of our Arab partners and and with our Israeli partners, frankly, because this is sort of the missing element at the heart of the story, uh, the unresolved quest for statehood by the Palestinians. And another thing that you you put your finger on, which I I, I found very much. Um, uh, mirrored in Israel and the West Bank, um, uh, Israeli Jews are afraid of Israeli Arabs. Israeli Arabs are afraid of uh, Jew, Israeli Jews. Palestinians are afraid of, of Israelis, and 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 Israelis are certainly terrified of, of Palestinians. There is a heightened state of fear and anxiety there among all the communities, which I, you know, as you said, is is reflected here in our own country, um, and the way that we begin to to pull people back from that state of anxiety and mistrust of the other is uh, precisely by going to the heart of the matter and um, helping the Palestinians in their quest for statehood. So do you have any concern that this war will grow more hardliners on both sides, folks Absolutely. that want to? Absolutely. Okay. And how do we prevent that? Getting the, uh, getting the conflict to, to an end as rapidly as possible and getting and making sure that Hamas is driven out of business. And I would just say that the, the secretary has a sort of turn of phrase about this. He said, you, you can not completely, you can destroy a military capability, a terrorist organization, but you can't kill an idea except with a better idea. And that's Palestinian statehood. So we talked about, you know, getting rid of the Taliban from Afghanistan. That has not happened. So we talk about, oh, we have to completely destroy Hamas. How does that happen? Because like you said, you cannot destroy ideas. 
It's a political process. It's a political, it's a political issue at the heart of it, which is the unresolved quest for statehood, and that is something that we can lead on and will lead on. Can you have success without diplomacy? No, it is absolutely critical to do it diplomatically. How are we working, given Netanyahu has stalled or um, rejected the U.S. call for a humanitarian pause? Um, does this remain a priority for us, and how do we move the needle with Israel on this? Uh, we are working relentlessly on the issue of humanitarian pause. I, um, last question. I know that the Palestinians were told to evacuate to the south from the north, and then they also have concerns about permanent displacement. So how do we still move innocent Palestinians to safety uh, so that we can minimize the casualties of innocent Palestinians? We've been crystal clear on the issue of displacement that we will not, that we will oppose any displacement, any population transfer of Palestinians outside Gaza, full stop. The question of getting Palestinian communities out of harm's way within Gaza is another question. And that is something that we have really urged uh, the Israelis, the IDF, to look to uh, with care and attention, but we will not. Um, we will. We will oppose any displacement of the Palestinians outside their own territory. Thank you for your responses. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Gently yields. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Moran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to Assistant Secretary Leaf and to Assistant Secretary Struhl for your I, I testimony. Can, I, I'll keep your time for you. I, I have to leave, unfortunately. But I just want to thank the two of you for being so patient and staying with us for so long. Um, and it's been very helpful having you here today. And thanks for putting up with everything else. And I yield back to the gentleman from Texas. Thank you to the uh, other gentleman from Texas. Um, ladies, I, I, want to, I want to ask you about, uh, first of all, uh, the Gaza Ministry of Health, the information we're getting from them, and what really appears to be some reliance on them uh, for information I'm not so sure is correct. I, I want to just go through a few things because over uh, a number of years through several conflicts, numerous bloody skirmishes between Israel and Hamas, UN agencies, as you know, and uh, others have cited the Gaza Health Ministry's death tolls in regular reports. The International Committee of the Red Cross and the Palestinian Red Crescent also use these numbers or rely on these numbers, as does the United Nations. Uh, several news publications cite numbers from Hamas uh, for uh, their data, but frankly, I'm a little skeptical about the data that's coming out. Both uh, President Biden and the National Security Council spokesman John Kirby have been publicly skeptical of the Gaza Health Ministry's numbers and called them, quote, unreliable due to, due to its control by Hamas, uh, and I agree with that. Um, <clears throat> Tell me a little bit about the, the types of propaganda, I'll start with uh, Assistant Secretary Leaf, that Hamas or other Iranian-backed proxies are spreading using either the, um, uh, the Ministry of Health or other organizations in, located in Palestine. So I, I would just say, Congressman, that um, Hamas is very uh, adroit um, at using social media in particular. Um, uh, to um, to circulate its propaganda, to circulate disinformation, misinformation. On the question you cite about statistics, I, I would just say that in a, this period of, of, of conflict um, and conditions of, of war, um, it is very difficult for any of us to assess what the, what the rate of casualties are. We think they're very high, frankly, and it could be that they're even higher than are being cited. We'll know only after the guns fall silent. So uh, I, you know, we we take we take in sourcing from a variety of um, of folks who are on the ground, um, and so I, I can't I can't stipulate to one figure or another, but I think they it, it's very possible that they are even higher than than is being reported. I appreciate that answer because that kind of goes to my next question. I was going to ask specifically about the number ten thousand. That's the number that, as of November the sixth, is being reported as the number of Palestinians in Gaza who have been killed. And my question to you was going to be, do, you, do we think that number is higher? Do we think it's lower? Do we have any visibility? Do we have any uh, uh, reliable information that would give us some indication one way or the other on that number? I mean, as I say, we have a lot of different sources from, from people that we, we know that are on the ground that are NGOs and others who are operating their um, UNRWA and so forth. And I think we'll only have a, a faithful figure um, at the end, uh, tragically. 
Um, but I would just say, you know, when I, you know, as a point of comparison, um, Gaza Strip is about 25 miles in length and 7 to 12 um, uh, miles in, in, um, in, in width. And you've got 2.2 million or thereabouts uh, people compressed into um, uh, a piece of land that is, well, it's comparable to Rhode Island, I guess, but I think Rhode Island is actually a bit larger and is half the population. So in these extraordinarily dense um, uh, confines, it, it just stands to reason there, that there are very high casualties. In, in my last minute, I want to switch gears and, and ask both of you about uh, Iran's participation early on. In the assault, it appeared that there were advanced missiles and drones targeting uh, civilians and civilian infrastructure used by Hamas. Uh, information that's come to me indicates that it would be Iran that really has provided that to them, either as a proxy or directly. And so what is it that we need to be doing to push back against Iran's participation in Hamas's terrorist attacks that started October the 7th and continue to today? So the question of, of you know, a direct Iranian um, involvement in that operation is still uh, still a, a question that analysts are looking at very closely. I heard a variety of opinions from intelligence services when I was out in the region, uh, um, with some officials saying that they found um, that even the political elements of Hamas were clearly in a state of, of, of surprise on October 7th, that this was a very uh, uh, siloed operation um, and that other elements of the so-called axis uh, were in the dark. All that said, uh, it's fair to say that Iran set the table for this in, in the years of support it gave to uh, training and lethal aid and finances to Hamas and to other elements of the of, of proxies. Um, we need to strangle the financing. Um, the weaponry, a lot of that has apparently been uh, manufactured on site in Gaza underground. So there's been an enormous amount of smuggling. We're going to, we're very dedicated to the proposition of helping Egypt do what's necessary to really tighten uh, its border controls and its screening. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Leaf. Assistant Secretary Struhl, you got left out. I'm so sorry about that. But ma'am, I appreciate uh, both of your time today. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Congressman Moran. We now proceed to Congressman Tom Keene of New Jersey. Um, thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, on the morning of Saturday, October 7th, Hamas launched the most brutal and expansive surprise attack on Israel since the Yom Kippur War 50 years ago. And while these attacks may have been perpetrated by Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, let's not forget that the real architects and motivator behind these actions is Iran. I, like many in this committee, support Israel's right to self-defense and stand ready to ensure that it has whatever it needs to ensure its survival. I, um, like others on this committee, share the concern that any pause will only allow Hamas to continue in its terroristic activities and we need to be united in our efforts to ensure that we, de de we defeat the evil that is Hamas. Can you walk us through um, a little bit now what, the, what are Hamas's current sources of funding and what diplomatic conversations is the administration having to try to limit funds to Hamas from jurisdictions that previously allowed the funds to flow to this terrorist group? So uh, we are really constructing a, a wide-ranging diplomatic effort on this front. And I, I think that we'll go back to, um, you know, the efforts that we had uh, that against ISIS, for instance, or al-Qaeda and other major terrorist organizations. The, the effort to dry up the funding, to cut it off from both governments, but also private uh, donations, is a long sort of trench warfare. And that's what we're going to be doing globally, going around to just restrict and a break up. Are you already doing that? I'm sorry. We are. We have started on that. Yes, we have. Okay. And uh, what is your assessment of Hezbollah's current pace of attacks against Israel? And what is Hezbollah hoping to achieve with these attacks? Um, the current rate of attacks against Israel from, from its northern border uh, is escalating. 
Uh, what we know is that Hamas or Hezbollah has an even larger missile arsenal than than Hamas. Uh, and by orders of magnitude. By orders of magnitude. And um, it is seeking to threaten uh, the security of the state of Israel, which is why hundreds of thousands of Israeli citizens have evacuated from the north. What consequences will Iran face from the U.S. for its, for its support of Hamas? I would say, first of all, it's not just a question of what consequences Iran will face from the United States. Iran should face consequences from the international community, from the region, and from everyone who shares an interest in a rules-based international order in which a state actor uh, funds non-state actors, arms, trains, equips, and directs them. So it's not just only about what the United States is doing, which is demonstrating a willingness and readiness to use military force multiple times in this administration and most recently only an hour ago, as well as the increases in force posture, the robust sanctions implementation, and the diplomatic coordination. And we're urging all of our, our allies and partners as well to impose consequences and costs on Iran for its support for terrorism. Um, you anticipated my next question, which is regarding the EU and the fact it had a divided response in consequence of these attacks. How are you helping ensure that uh, the EU, as well as going into the issue that you know, that Congressman James talked about at the uh, UN, how are we ensuring that any of these broader organizations are standing um, up against evil and supporting good? That's the labor-intensive efforts of, of diplomatic work, and that's something that we're very focused on. As my colleague said, um, this. I, I would put it um, in, in, in the way that I did with a number of our partners as I worked around the region this past several weeks. This crisis really illuminated starkly for all of them what they all knew intellectually or they knew through their intelligence, which was Iran had this architecture of, of proxies. But they all sort of came up on the net, as it were, with this crisis. And you see uh, the Houthis you know, just really desperate to get into the fight. You see the Iraqi militia groups and the threat that they pose in multiple directions, including the state of Iraq. So this has really highlighted for everyone, if they needed highlighting, um, how destructive this architecture is to everyone's interests. So it is, um, we'll, we'll have some hard conversations with those who are um, slow to the punch. If, no, if we need to have, with respect, successful conversations, not hard conversations. We don't get credit for trying. Right. We get credit for results. I agree with you, Congressman. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Congressman Tom Kane. And uh, eight weeks ago today, I was meeting with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and I gave him the Tom Kane presentation, the American people will stand with Israel, whatever it takes for their survival. We know it's appropriate that we conclude um, with an outstanding freshman comes from Mike Lawler of New York. Thank you, Chairman. Um, last month, President Biden announced $100 million in humanitarian aid uh, for the Gaza Strip. Uh, obviously, uh, no one wants to see innocent life uh, lost or impacted uh, by uh, the ongoing conflict. However, I have great concern about this $100 million uh, and uh, the reality uh, that Hamas, as the governing body in Gaza, uh, would intercept or use these funds uh, to further fund terrorism, to further fund uh, the slaughtering of Jews. Who is receiving these funds and what accountability measures are there to ensure uh, that Hamas does not have access to it? Uh, and what would be the response of the administration uh, if they found uh, that, in fact, these funds were somehow being utilized to further Hamas's terrorism? So, uh, you know, at this moment, I, you know, it's hardly possible to say that Hamas is governing. It is down uh, you would agree they are the government of No, no I Gaza. understand that. I understand. I, I'm okay. not disputing that. I'm just saying at this moment in this conflict, nobody's governing. 
Uh, no, the, they're the, using their civilians as human shields. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. That's what I mean. Um, but this is coordinated fully with Israel. Uh, this, these monies will have oversight, rigorous oversight. They will be, it will be run through trusted partners. It is really di directed at humanitarian, critical humanitarian assistance in the first order. So when you say in concert with Israel, uh, are the funds going to Israel to administer? Who Who no, is administering Israel, the funds? No, Israel has made it clear that it does not want to be in the business of administrating, administering anything in Gaza. So who's administering it? We are, we have the oversight and we go through trusted uh, partners, NGOs. Who are our trusted partners? I can get you a list of those, sir. Please. Um, in terms of Iran, uh, it is clear uh, to many of us, uh, includes, including from reporting uh, by the Wall Street Journal, uh, that Iran played some role uh, in uh, the lead up to these attacks, that Iran has uh, continually uh, backed and funded Hamas, uh, that the stated intention uh, ultimately is to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. We all acknowledge that. Um, do you uh, believe that the administration uh, is prepared to hold Iran accountable? Uh, and in what way? Because I just passed last week uh, the SHIP Act, which would increase uh, secondary sanctions uh, on countries that purchase Iranian petroleum. Uh, since Joe Biden took office, uh, Iranian uh, petroleum sales and the revenue thereof has increased by 59 percent. What is the administration doing to hold Iran accountable? Thank you for your question. Uh, we have made it clear that Iranian fingerprints are all over the funding, arming, training, equipping, and directing of a variety of non-state actors, from Hamas to Lebanese Hezbollah to the Iran-aligned militia groups in Iraq and Syria to the Houthis in Yemen. And we do hold Iran responsible and accountable for the acts of terrorism we see in the region. As recently as this evening, when President Biden ordered precision strikes against IRGC-affiliated facilities in eastern Syria. Does the administration deny or confirm uh, the Wall Street Journal's uh, previous reporting about Iran's involvement? in the October 7th terrorist attacks. The administration has been very clear that Iran has had a role through its arming, training, equipping, and funding of Hamas. Does the administration confirm or deny the reports of the Wall Street Journal with respect to, to the, the October 7th? Wall Street Journal article. What Assistant Secretary Leaf also said earlier is that there is not a smoking gun piece of intelligence that confirms that Iran directed the specific nature, scope, scale, and timing of the October 7 attack, but there's no question that Iran is responsible because of its arming, training, funding, and equipping of Hamas. Given, given that, and given your statement there, should the $6 billion in unfrozen funds be permanently refrozen? That would be a decision for um, senior level of the government, but at this point, <clears throat> that $6 billion has not been touched, and it is uh, the, the, um, the, the use of it is for humanitarian purposes only. I yield back. Thank you very much, Congressman Lawler and Secretary Leaf and Secretary Struhl. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And I think you can see uh, that you have uh, bipartisan support of uh, Republicans, Democrats. Uh, we want you to succeed. Uh, uh, additionally, uh, lightning is going to strike, but I agree with the Washington Post. Uh, this, uh, we want the president to succeed. This is going to be his legacy. Uh, and we have an existential situation developing 
uh, with an axis of evil with war criminal Putin, the Chinese Communist Party, and indeed uh, Iran, Iran and Iranian puppets. And it must be addressed, and we want you to succeed. And so God, just understand that it's just uh, for our families uh, and with the potential, uh, as the New York Post has reported, of a potential terrorist attack here in the United States is uh, imminent. Um, what you're doing is so important, and we want you to succeed. Additionally, as we conclude, I want to thank the staff. Uh, it's amazing uh, their persistence to be here 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And with this, we shall adjourn. Thank you, Congressman.